innovative, fast, flexible, convenient. LinguaSkill is the accurate English test with fast results, developed by Cambridge Assessment English, part of the University of Cambridge. Whether you are an education institution or employer, you can use LinguaSkill to measure the English language level of candidates or employees. There are two versions of the test available, general and business, both covering all four language skills, speaking, writing, listening and reading. And you can choose which of these skills you want to test. LinguaSkill has been trialled by speakers of over 40 languages from 50 countries, making LinguaSkill accurate and reliable. And with individual and group reports generated within 48 hours, it's fast too. Results are aligned to international standards, allowing you to make informed decisions and compare performance. Online and using artificial intelligence technology, LinguaSkill allows you to run and invigilate the test at your own site at any time. Find out how you can simplify your English language testing at cambridgeenglish.org forward slash LinguaSkill. LinguaSkill. Innovative. Fast. Flexible. Convenient. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, please put a plus in the chat box. Fantastic, I can see many pluses. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's conference, Innovative Ways of Assessing with Cambridge English, Lingua Skill, Clarity and Perspective for your students. Cambridge Assessment English is a part of the University of the University of Cambridge. We help million people learn English and prove their skills to the world. For us, learning uh, is more than just exams and grades. It's about having confidence to communicate. With the right support, learning a language is an amazing journey. And we are here for every learner every step of the way. Today, we're happy to welcome you to our conference and we are ready to introduce our new product, our new fantastic online test, LinguaSkill, powered by artificial intelligence. We are ready to reveal the science behind the test and to share experience of the best universities in Russia, MIFI and RANIPA. So before we start, uh, I would like to inform you that the recording of the webinar will be shared soon. If you have any problems with sound or video, please um, uh, be patient, first of all, and uh, Try to refresh the page, and it's better to use Chrome for a comfortable participation. We'd love to hear from you. Please ask your questions in the questions section, in the question box. We will be happy to answer all your questions. So now I'm ready to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Hisham al -Sagbini. Professor Hisham, I will upload your slides. Great, thank you very much, uh, Yulia. Uh, it's uh, giving me really great pleasure to be with uh, so many people that uh, I think I already met before in previous um, encounters and uh, those that I haven't met uh, before. Uh, it's really a good opportunity to interact and share a few ideas of our best practices and, um, you know, share with you as well some of our research findings. Um, uh, at the beginning, I'd like to thank Yulia and the um, uh, team at uh, the Russia office, the Moscow office, for inviting me and having me here today. Uh, and I wish you all uh, a very pleasant and useful um, event. 
so uh, today I will be focusing mainly on um, a, a, an interesting idea. It's not a new idea per se. Uh, it's an idea that I think is um, um, worth um, exploring further. And it's an invitation for you to really dig deeper uh, in, you know, in the, um, uh, in the uh, little details that are suited with it. Today we'll be talking about uh, the flipped classroom. T today we'll talk about how the flipped classroom model works and what can Cambridge provide in return. How can we basically aid um, our teachers and support them in adopting the flipped classroom model? Um, so, uh, of course, I think we have around 40 minutes in this presentation. In these 40 minutes, uh, we will go through um, three things. So we will talk about the concept um, that we are uh, driving forward, uh, the concept that's driving um, our exam uh, setup, our exam structure, which is learning-oriented assessment, uh, and how that can feed into a flipped classroom structure. So today um, we will share as well with you uh, a case study that I think you will find very, very useful of how uh, a flipped classroom structure uh, helped uh, a large number of students worldwide. Uh, and then I will briefly talk about some of the tools that you can find useful in this quest. Um, so at the beginning, basically, when... Um, 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 you know, a little bit about my background. So um, my background is mainly in educational inclusion. So um, uh, one of my main um, uh, um, interests um, uh, really lie in how can we incorporate everybody in the learning process? How can we make sure that learning is actually taking place? How can we make sure that everybody, that everybody uh, in, um, in our classes is actually equally benefiting? Um, so, um, so I spent um, uh, around 10 years of my life uh, searching concepts related to educational inclusion um, and how we can basically um, make uh, exams and assessments more inclusive. And I, in the last few years, focused in my work on, um, uh, on concepts related to learning-oriented assessments and um, exponential learning and uh, more practical approaches to learning. And I can't really see a better time to talk about these new themes than this. We are indeed living in unprecedented uh, circumstances, um, you know, where millions of learners around the world are uh, actually uh, studying from home. Um, and that really means that the traditional concept of learning uh, has shifted. The traditional concept, I mean, if you're comparing that term over a course of, say, 30 or 40 years, there is a, a remarkable change in our approach to learning. There's a remarkable change in how we, as educators, look at learning. So if you basically consider what used to happen in most universities, around the world really, when it comes to the concept of teaching. So teaching was mainly passing instructions. I give you a set of instructions, you have to follow it. I give you a textbook, you take it and memorize it. It was as simple as that. In the 80s and the 90s, the concept of learners and learner engagement started to develop. Now, if you notice, particularly in the last few years, there's a fundamental shift towards discovery model. A discovery model where basically a teacher doesn't provide the information, doesn't provide the instructions, you know, we basically give a structure to be followed and then the discovery process is the main task that the learner should undertake. So if you're thinking with me um, about this journey that the concept of teaching has uh, developed into, it's a remarkable one. And that's, that's when one of my main research interests. Um, I'm just trying to find my way to move between the slides. I think I figured it out now. Yeah. So I think the whole idea is not to, uh, you know, kind of give you new ideas, sorry, to reach on things that you already know. I think the, the most important part is to develop that little bit extra that you didn't know. Um, you know, there's always room for improvement. There's always 
um, um, you know, uh, an, uh, an idea where we can develop our operations further, particularly because of the fact that we need to make our work more relevant. And relevance here is crucial. Relevance is how can we make the learner experience closer to reality? How can we make our um, you know, um, practices in the classroom, whether this classroom is a physical classroom or virtual classroom, how can we make that experience more direct, more straight to the point, and more useful to the learner? How many of us really, over the course of our, um, our studying years, um, felt that many of the subjects were irrelevant? We didn't like them. And how many of the things that we studied at university that we remember now? You know, so the process of the, let's apply all these concepts on us first, and let's basically see for ourselves how these concepts are changing. Obviously, in most of this event, everything basically we're doing is focusing on language learning. So we looked at the, we were talking about the bigger concept of learning, making learners, learning more enjoyable, making learners, learning, sorry, more um, relevant. Let's now dig a little bit deeper into language learning. Now, I think the, one of the main challenges in that basically we always face when it comes to language uh, learning is how can we basically make the content appealing to learners? How can we basically teach things like grammar or the use of capitalization, punctuation, etc.? So lots of things that basically, um, you know, um, kind of, tend to make the concept uh, a little bit more challenging. For that quest, I will start, I will start with this model. In front of you uh, on the screen, um, there is some work that's been reconstructed based on Dale's cone of learning that was introduced in the 60s. Dale, in the 60s, talked about a concept where learning takes place based on the activities that are associated with it. Dale talked about the way we remember information and knowledge after we finish a program or after we finish a course. Dale talks about multiple levels. Dale says that we tend to remember around 10% of the things that we read after finishing a course. Dale says that we tend to remember after two weeks, um, after two weeks, we tend to remember things that we read no more than 10%. But that can basically be dramatically increased if we make learners involved in the process. And that's where the interesting part lies. According to Dale, according to the work that's been done in the 60s and developed to reach that pyramid that you have in front of you here, we are able to make people remember, and obviously you will see in a minute that our focus is not only remembering, our emphasis is on analysis and synthesis afterwards, but we can retain knowledge up to 100% if we are actively involved in that process. So the point I'm trying to make here, that there is obviously, it's no brainer to everybody. When you look at this diagram, you would see that, yeah, I need to make sure that my learners are all heading towards action learning. But what does action learning mean? And how can we ensure that action learning is actually taking place? And how can we make sure that this nature of action learning is pretty much controlled? We've got various questions and we've got various ideas that we have to answer. But this is the starting point for our discussion today. In our discussion today, we will look at how action point can be turned into active learning. Uh, sorry, how can action learning turn can be turned into relevant learning for, for learners to take and use and utilize after their classes, after they finish their courses. Most importantly, when it comes to language learning, how can we make sure that they apply it and use it in their daily lives? 
So our starting point, the first point that we in general agree on is the fact that I need to make my classes much more active. We will see in a, in a minute a few tips on how can we make them more active. But that's my first statement. Action learning is the way to go. But the question next is how can we do that action learning? And how can we ensure that action learning is relevant? Remember, the buzzword that we started the conversation with is relevance. How can we make our learning more relevant to the learners? Useful. So the starting point for this discussion is really to, um, to start thinking of where does learning take place? Where does learning take place? Learning takes place inevitably in classes. But one thing we need to consider is the personality of our classes. How can we ensure that our classroom has a personality that appeals to learners? How can I make sure that whatever I do in a classroom is really kind of improving the learning environment, is helping my learners learn more? For that, I will utilize, I will borrow the work that Colt did in exponential learning theory. And I will start with the definition of learning. So I'll go one step back. At the beginning, we said that basically we, one way to ensure that learning is more relevant and one way to ensure that learning is going to take place um, in, um, uh, in our classrooms is by focusing on action learning. So let's go one step back and let's define what learning is. All of us, I'm sure, all the people that are listening to me today would have various understandings, various forms of, um, of understanding learning. And that's no surprise because we all have different um, mechanisms for learning, different approaches to learning. Cole talked about a very interesting idea. He said learning uh, he said learning is simply a process to create knowledge. So learning is creating knowledge. But how can we create knowledge? Kolb says that creating knowledge is transforming our experiences. And that's a very interesting point. Let's pause here for a second. So we learn, for, according to Kolb, by transforming the experience into something we remember. That means the underpinning concept of learning here is experience. Let's dig deeper. Let's explore this concept even further. So in this structure, and just for the sake of time, I'm trying to, um, to breeze through this, but this is really, really useful. I love this. I love the way Cole presented his theory. And I don't want to bore you with theories, but this is not only a theory. This is something that we can see um, in our own eyes. That something that I experienced, something that I went through, is something that stays with me forever. So, according to Kolb, the idea that basically we want to focus on is obviously doing. So I want my learners to do stuff. So I want my learners to practice, to take part, to actively engage in stuff in the classroom. Be it, or whether this classroom um, uh, is a virtual classroom or a physical classroom. It doesn't make any difference to me as a teacher, as an educator, as a researcher. What matters to me 
is that this person is able to, and this is very important, is able to reflect. Reflect, that means to relate that particular experience, to relate it to a personal experience. So the first one is to reflect. And then after to reflect, to, to plan, or sorry, to think. To think of the possible ways that we're estimated, the, 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 the structure, the environment, the, the, what we call the abstract conceptualization of the term. To understand, um, you know, what goes in it, what doesn't go in it, what the rules are, what the, what the um, standards are. So to understand all these different things, we need to think. And then afterwards, we need to plan. We need to plan how the, this experience or how this doing is going to be implemented. And that's what we call the active experimentation. So the point I'm trying to make here is that let's relate that, um, um, let's relate that to our classes. Let's pause here for a minute. Let's reflect. Kolb says that learning is simply a transformation of our experience. That means it's inevitable for us to get our learners involved. Now is the time where we have to make our learners involved because they are studying offline. They're studying, they're studying online. They're studying off campus. So the first element that I have to consider is the doing part. What kind of activity shall I give? What kind of task shall I give to my learner? And then that learner would have to think, to reflect, to make it personal. And then that, um, you know, uh, basically would think of how the whole concept works and then how it can be applied again. So do reflect, think and plan. You can start, I mean, the argument here is obviously, oh, I should start from um, one point before the other. Well, of course, you can start at any point. I can basically transform my activities from the reflection part. Or from the thinking part. The ultimate thing that we need to focus on, or that we need to really relate to, is the doing part. So, so from the same idea, what makes our learning successful? And obviously, this is a question that I would really like everybody to take part in. What, in your view, would make your learning successful? I would be more than happy for all of you to take part in the chat section and just comment. Let's just basically reflect, let's just think, exactly as we were saying earlier. Yes, learning by mistakes, absolutely. Try and error, absolutely. Um, yeah, so there are various ideas that, um, um, that you can um, stem from the, the concept of successful learning. Um, speaking practice, of course. I mean, I'm seeing lots of comments um, on the side for how basically we can get involved. And uh, of course, uh, everybody is encouraged to take part in the discussion. I welcome every comment, every question, every idea. But just due to the time restrictions, please type your comments uh, in the chat box. That would be much useful and much easier for me to follow as well. I would really appreciate that. All right, so going back to the very same point, so now we've got a number of ideas um, floating there. We've got um, um, active learning, uh, that's our underpinning, um, our underpinning concept, and then exponential learning through Kolb's idea of learning by doing. 
Absolutely, there are lots of great ideas. Um, practice, exercise, motivating learners, um, plenty, plenty of ideas. But on the other hand, one of the most important points, one of the most important points that, that we sometimes ignore or overlook is the feelings part. The individual feeling, or our approach, or the learner's approach to the concept of learning is sometimes overlooked or not basically given enough attention. Let's think for a minute of how you would feel about a book that you read. So there are various ways that keep people engaged in these difficult times <clears throat> through developing positive feelings. Great ideas. I mean, I can see lots of great answers. So the whole concept that I'm trying to focus on here is obviously we are trying to set a theme for multiple things and there's a flow of ideas that I want to maintain. We start with action learning. We move to learning by doing, an emphasis on exercise and activities. And then we're talking about successful learning, and we're talking about positive feelings in the classroom as part of learning. And positive feelings, by the way, um, or developing positive feelings, is very much, very much um, relevant to how we provide feedback to our learners. Being friendly, um, uh, being, um, you know, um, is a great uh, start here, so I can see some of the comments on the side. A lot of the work that's been done on providing feedback um, has been done over the past 10 years, I think, by a number of researchers. And one of these researchers in particular, Carl Drake, and I think I mentioned that in the previous webinar as well, um, is how to develop, how to develop um, a growth mindset. And developing a growth mindset is really, really, uh, integral part of developing these positive feeling structure, a culture. And the growth mindset is simply the ability of, our, um, of the teachers and the uh, educator to um, make people think of the hard work they did, the hard work that they did, not the intelligence or a specific achievement that, um, um, that they got in one exam or one course. So the feedback is really uh, one point that basically we need to consider. On the other hand, unsuccessful learning is a very common experience. Now, I would obviously um, um, not ask you to write down your um, unsuccessful learning simply due to the time restrictions and the fact that we have um, only around 15 minutes left. Um, but that's where I think most of the work needs to be done. So in successful learning, a round of applause, that's great, we did what we want to do. But our work in these webinars is to focus on this component. Unsuccessful learning. How does unsuccessful learning take place? Why does it take place in the first place? And how can we overcome it? There are, I mean, in a previous research, we gathered various senses. And uh, these are the answers, by the way, from educators from uh, various groups um, and um, various um, um, uh, entities. And, um, and obviously the answers that we got are really interesting because many of them were saying that it's lack of opportunity to practice, uh, or uh, the type of feedback that's given, or there's no motivation, or the lack of time to make sense of, uh, of learning, or the content of the materials, etc., etc. So the question that's, that's asked itself now is, how can we, from all these different concepts, make a model, build our own model? So from these terms that I just mentioned, from these terms that I just mentioned, there are various ways where we can, um, where we can explore 
where we can build and develop our own model further. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to log my... All right, so the concept that basically we are focusing on is the model that we have to build. And this model, we did the following task. This is a very interesting model that I would really encourage everybody to take a look at. In this model, we combined all the different factors and we put them in one structure. Structure, we have four elements. The first element is wanting, and that's basically what drives learning in the first place. And the need to do it, and then doing, and providing feedback as another important and crucial element, and then digesting. So the whole model is based and centered around these four elements. And it's simply a combination of what Dale said and what Cole talked about in his previous work. So this model, I think, would be very useful and very handy um, to think about even further. All right, so uh, apologies for this interruption. Um, to uh, block the power for my uh, iPad. So what I was saying is the following. So the active model that basically we developed is made up of four different elements. The first element is wanting and needing to understand what drives learning why do they have to learn so it's a very important part of learning to understand the needs of our learners to be able to identify why our learners are in the classroom why are they learning english do they want to travel do they want to work do they want to study further so it's very important and then the second element is doing doing given exercises that are relevant and um uh, and then feedback is also, you know, as we said before, is crucial in um, uh, developing positive feelings for learning and then digesting and reflecting. So that's really um, um, the model that basically we wanted to develop. And obviously I'll leave that here for a minute. And I will go back to the very first point that I started talking about at the beginning. The shift in our concept and understanding to teaching means that these concepts that basically we just highlighted are now new tools in our hands. That model where, where learning is active, where learning is taking place um, out of necessity, because I need to understand why this learner is there, and I need to understand, I need to make that learner involved to make them participate in learning, and to emphasize on discovery model, to emphasize on the fact that learners must discover um, learning, must discover um, the concepts that are related to, um, um, you know, must discover the concept, must discover the ideas, the tools, and the role of the teacher in this context is simply to facilitate learning, to give directions, to give pathways. Now, to dig a little bit deeper into this, and let's go a little bit more practical, Talking about English language and talking about the common European framework in Europe, as many people know, um, you know, one of the main challenges is to raise English level for all uh, learners. So obviously the target is to really push it up to um, B2 level. In many countries, that's basically uh, the target. So, so to do that, there has been a lot of study and there has been a lot of um, talk about the various forms of assessment that's used 
and the various tools that I incorporated. And I'm, I'm sure that many people that are listening to me today are, are familiar with the concepts of formative assessment and the summative assessments. And obviously here today we're not in, uh, talking about these terms. We're talking about a model that's simply going to be very handy in, um, in the structure that we're developing as we speak. So, if the concept is mainly learning, so the assessment should be related to it. So the assessment um, should be linked with learning more effectively. So we should call for, instead of learning or assessment for learning, which is the formative tool that we use throughout the program, or assessment of learning, which is measuring how much information we remember, to assessment as learning. So the most important and the most delicate element here is making sure that learning is taking place through the assessment piece that we introduce. As simple as that. But how can we ensure that this is happening and how can we ensure that there is um, an approach that we have to consider? The starting idea here The starting point in this discussion is looking at our classrooms in a little bit closer eye. In our classrooms, we've got various levels. So we've got um, red, green, purple, and blue, or blue and purple. Now, our main strength as educators and as teachers lies in the blue box, where most of our learners are. But will you agree with me that ultimately, not all learners are in the same level or the same level? So the point I'm trying to make here, that ultimately when we are trying to build um, a structure for learning, we have to understand, as we said at the beginning, the personality of the classroom, and we have to make sure that all the learners are involved through active participation, and we have also to make sure that all our learning is, um, is done or is related to a personal experience. So that means the best way to do this is through um, the interaction of the various worlds of learning. And that's the interaction of the various elements that take place in the classroom. And that includes the personal world, and that's the personal capacities of the learners, the content or the subject itself, the skills and the social encounters, and of course the assessment criteria and the reference point. And I'm sure you all agree with me that, uh, you know, formally, of course, all of us learn through the materials or through the usual tools that are presented officially. Um, but there is also a natural acquisition of knowledge. There's a very interesting question that popped up um, in the chat box here that talks about teamwork. And obviously not what I meant, you know. So the question was, can we still work in groups if we are looking for individualized learning? And the answer is absolutely yes. Teamwork and group work is an integral part of learning. Teamwork, uh, as I said here, that basically there is an, another aspect of learning that takes place naturally. We call it the natural acquisition of learning. And the natural acquisition of learning is simply looking at the observations um, and um, you know, how, other, uh, how our peers are doing it and then simply doing something similar. That's the whole idea. And that doesn't mean that we, we don't understand the needs of individual learners within the team, within the group. But ultimately, we're just saying that uh, the teamwork or the group work that basically we're calling for is, um, um, is based on understanding the individual needs of our learners. So that means, in a practical example to this concept, we will go through a very quick exercise and then I'll leave you with a case study in a minute. But obviously, from a program like this, when obviously an English language course is driven by the learning objectives, um, and the learning objectives will feed into a course, as in theory, all courses should be based on standardized tools and standardized learning objectives. And in this context, in English language context, it's a CFR. Then, for each learner, we would give an, an individual 
um, or for group activities or language activities that are, can be either taken individually or in groups. It doesn't make, make any, any difference. But the main thing that matters to me is that I am, as a teacher, not dictating knowledge. I'm not providing information. The learners themselves are following that kind of information. And, um, you know, they are basically extracting and discovering knowledge. They are finding the answers to their assessment pieces. I'm providing feedback as we go. So in other words, we are just simply applying the cycle that we uh, reached at the beginning of this presentation, which is developing or understanding the needs and the wants, and then the planning part, and then obviously the implementation, and then the doing, and then of course providing feedback and digesting. Repeating the cycle multiple times will of course give me what we call a record of achievement. So now, very briefly, there is a video, a very interesting video that I would like you to, um, to see. Uh, I think uh, my colleague um, in the Russia office will help me play that video. Uh, and then we will discuss the ideas after we finish. But that's simply based on what we just said. So I'll leave you to it. So you see how they're in the same page? Decided to take a risk. Frankly, we weren't doing very well and flipped it on its head. Not literally, of course. Very well. And so, you know, we had to make a change. I mean, we were, we were desperate for change. His aha moment came while coaching his 11-year-old son's baseball team. Having learned to record and post instructional videos for his players to watch outside of practice, he was struck by how much time was then um, left to, to focus uh, on individual players on, on the field. Uh, iPad. He saw the educational so saying, potential the starting with the power of videos. So Just go back and watch the them. Model that basically we they want, and, and in me as, a, as an instructor or elements. expert, I don't have to redo that all the time, and I can spend my time with, with the students in class and actually assisting them. And so if I could do that with 11-year-olds, imagine what we could do with 15 or 16-year-olds doing math. Why do they have to learn? Green went all in, flipping the entire the school, the urging his staff to rethink the use of technology and how it complements traditional they teaching, they and getting local to businesses travel? to help they fund the effort. So the legislative branch makes a law. Now, and lectures are recorded and posted online. The American Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865. And, um, or teachers uh, can assign outside videos from the popular you know, Khan Academy school, and TED Talks. In, um, Students uh, watch these videos as learning, homework outside of class. Why do you say it's plutonium? In class, students now do what was once so considered really, homework. Um, Assignments designed to test learning to comprehension. Clintondale teachers say this allows more time for one-on-one -on -one help and often encourages students to collaborate in problem solving. But English teacher Rob Damron said it took some convincing. When we first did this, it was funny to look around that staff meeting and look at a lot of staff members, you know, especially the ones that have been here 25, 30 years and saying, um, out of what are you talking about? What's I a need blog? To why you know, what's a Google there? group? I need to Apostrophes I need to makes make that a noun show ownership to or possession. For teaching for 20 years, I know what lessons kids are going to have a, a problem to with. On the but fact that I think with doing this flipped so approach, discover. there's problems I didn't even know existed. Um, learning. So you, you really discover. can't hide back there in the corner and say, yeah, I got it. Um, you know, and then the teacher sees later on, ah, well, no, you really didn't get it. Um, One problem the school concept, faced head-on, students who can't afford or don't have access to technology outside of class. They're given extra time in the school's media life. Segregation before 1954. Taking the technology-driven approach further, some lesson plans are now tailored to have students use the latest trends in social media. We deserve to vote. We deserve to vote. Um, you know, like one of this the main project that required constitutional level, amendments who, to be summed up in uh, six seconds for the popular website so Vine. Really Green says that to, taken um, all together, teacher. after three yeah. years, the flip is in many paying countries, off. That's basically and our ACT gains have, 
have shown you know, oh, double the national so average as far as ACT gains. You know, state testing, we've had some mixed study. results on that. And, and we've of, also um, seen an increase in graduation rates to almost 90%, college acceptance rates at 80%. Like Senior Daryl Wallace sure Jr. many people is one that are listening to me today. His grades have uh, risen from a 2.5 GPA as a freshman to 3.5 as a senior. So today, and he says the flip has played a big role. About these terms. He now watches videos on his cell phone while taking the We're bus home about, into a rough uh, section of Detroit, where he lives with his mother in, and four sisters. Um, in the I really looked speak. at the videos more because I knew I might not have as so, much time at home because my sisters are in college. Learning, they need the computer, so, so I'm like, I can do it on my phone. It. So and the bus ride is like um, 30 minutes, so I probably can get like half of my so assignment done. Daryl's mother, Sabrina Young, also likes the flipped model, learning. saying there's only so, so much, much she can do to help with traditional program. homework. Especially I'm doing it at school is a plus to, for him and as, as well as so me because I just didn't remember the majority of it. Is the popularity sure of online learning has surged in recent years and flipped classrooms have started popping up everywhere, from elementary but schools to some of the nation's top universities. Clintondale is the first U.S. Um, high school to do a total flip. Our idea here. Justin Reich has been studying the trend and says he's cautiously optimistic. What is exciting to me about the flipped classroom? The starting point in this discussion is, is looking at our classrooms in a little bit closer eye. What are the best ways for me to use my time, levels. especially so the very precious red, time I have green, in classrooms with my students? Blue. And then what are the kinds of direct instruction that now, I could provide that could be digitized so that people could watch it again? But Reich says that flipping alone isn't enough. As with any lesson plan, it all depends on exactly what's being offered. If what we see from the flipped classroom is that we take um, bad lectures and uninteresting worksheet problems so that characterize the point I'm trying to make here that students that have in schools, and we simply flip the order of those two um, things, the odds learning, that we, we see significant improvement in our schools is pretty low. And so now and we're going to be taking sure derivative the with respect to T. Meanwhile, some individual teachers are experimenting with the flipped classroom on their own. Three years ago, um, Stacy Roshan flipped her upper-level math classroom. So that means the best way to do this is through um, the interaction of the various worlds of learning. And that's the interaction of the various elements that take place in the classroom. And that includes the personal world, and that's the personal capacities of the learners, the content or the subject itself, the skills and the social encounters, and of course, the assessment criteria and the reference point. And I'm sure you all agree with me that, uh, you know, formally, of course, all of us learn through the materials or through the usual tools that are presented officially. Um, but there's also a natural acquisition of knowledge. There's a very interesting question that popped up um, in the chat box here that talks about teamwork. And obviously not what I meant, you know. So the question was, can we still work in groups if we are looking for individualized learning? And the answer is absolutely yes. Teamwork and group work is an integral part of learning. Teamwork, uh, as I said here, that basically there is an, another aspect of learning that takes place naturally. We call it the natural acquisition of learning. And the natural acquisition of learning is simply looking at the observations um, and um, you know, how, other, uh, how our peers are doing it and then simply doing something similar. That's the whole idea. And that doesn't mean that we, we don't understand the needs of individual learners within the team, within the group, but ultimately we're just saying that uh, the teamwork or the group work that basically we're calling for is, um, um, is based on understanding the individual needs of our learners. So that means, in a practical example to this concept, we will go through a very quick exercise, and then I'll leave you with a case study in a minute. But obviously, from a program like this, when obviously an English language course is driven by the learning objectives, um, and the learning objectives will feed into a course, as in theory, all courses should be based on 
standardized tools and standardized learning objectives. And in this context, in English language context, it's a CFR. Then for each learner, we would give an, an individual um, or for group activities or language activities that are, can be either taken individually or in groups. It doesn't make, make any, any difference. But the main thing that matters to me is that I am as a teacher not dictating knowledge. I'm not providing information. The learners themselves are following that kind of information. And, um, uh, you know, they are basically extracting and discovering knowledge. They are finding the answers to the assessment pieces. I'm providing feedback as we go. So in other words, we are just simply applying the cycle that we uh, reached at the beginning of this presentation, which is developing or understanding the needs and the wants, and then the planning part, and then obviously the implementation, and then the doing, and then of course providing feedback and digesting. Thank you very We're much, this cycle Dr. Multiple Hisham. Times. That was fantastic. Well, of course, give me very useful. Well, Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, your support. Achieve. So now um, I'm, I'm ready to introduce the next presenter. Um, just a second. Sue Trori, Global Head of Adult and Higher Education, Cambridge Assessment English. Sue, please start webcasting. Go on air. So there is a uh, button uh, in the upper right hand corner, it is called go on air. You just need to click on it and start webcasting. Ian, probably you could join us. Um, Hello, everybody. I hope you can uh, hear me and see you, see me. I know my colleague Sue is just uh, joining the presentation now. She's had a few uh, problems with her with her computer, but I'm sure that she will be uh, be here shortly. But um, I'm more than happy to. Uh, carry on in in Sue's absence and uh, to start the presentation for her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, just moving the slides. So, as uh, as you're probably aware, um, Cambridge Assessment English. We're very proudly uh, a department of the University of Cambridge. Um, here you can see uh, the beautiful uh, King's College and the lawns, and I'll just let you know that that isn't me working, walking up the front with my dog. Uh, but it is a lovely day like this today in Cambridge. So, just to tell you a little bit more about uh, Cambridge Assessment English, we're very proud to have one of the largest research departments in the world, um, and we are internationally respected as the quality standard for English and language assessment. We've been in the business for over a hundred years and this is our sole business. We hope and we believe that all our exams are fair to those from different cultures and also with many different levels of English and our exams as I'm sure you're aware are widely accepted by governments 
educational authorities and employers worldwide. It's really interesting for us to think about the, the fourth industrial revolution, which is upon us now uh, amidst this COVID crisis and the changes that this is going to have in terms of the way that uh, people are trained and the, people, the way that people work. Research shows that nowadays people will have to retrain two or three times during their working career. And also the fact that many skills that we learn will only be as valuable for half the amount of time that they would have been in the past. But one thing that's really important to, to bear in mind with the fourth industrial revolution is that communication skills in particular are going to be of the utmost importance. And you can see here on this information map that we've mapped out some of the key um, fourth industrial revolution skills that people are going to have. Communication is front and center here. And that means that the, the need to be able to communicate well in a lingua franca such as English is going to be of even more importance in the future. So this is a slide, an interesting one, just to, tell, to, just to give you some statistics about the way that uh, English is, is used and considered in a range of academic and corporate situations. You can see here, it's quite interesting that over 70% of um, executives said that their workforce needed to master English in order for the corporation to grow. And 25% more of these said that over 50% of their workforce would need to speak English. So it, it just proves that even, even today with more technology, more uh, devices that allow us to, uh, to work in, in multiple languages, English is still so important as a lingua franca for us, and those communication skills are so important for students as they prepare for the world of work. So this is just another graph that shows you quite the, the size of the English language skills gap. Um, you can see here that um, even in English-speaking countries, over 22% of organizations felt that there was a communication gap with their staff. Uh, and that obviously only grows with, as you can see, the, uh, the other countries that, that perhaps don't use English quite as widely. And these are just some quotes uh, that tell you how important it is for students and for um, staff of corporations to be able to communicate while using the English language. And there are lots of ways that we can help in uh, dealing with this communication gap. So first of all, organizations we know need to um, define the requirements of what they need from a language test. Language tests help to build confidence among staff who are attending courses or students as they're attending courses as well. Having a qualification at the end of the language course can really give uh, a sense of achievement to the students and also helps to make teaching practical and relevant. I'm sure you're all aware of the theory of positive washback and the positive effect that exams can have on learning and on teaching and on the development of curriculum. Also, we feel that qualifications can help students to show progress and can help organizations and also universities, higher education institutions to set their goals and align these to their needs. So finally, I just wanted to mention that Cambridge is a founding member of ALTE, the Institute for Automated Language Teaching and Assessment. And you can see here that this is a collaboration between us, Cambridge Assessment English, as well as the Cambridge Computer Lab, the Department of Engineering, and the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics. And we've come together to develop this automated language teaching and assessment institute. And I'm going to be talking about one of our one of the products that's been developed as a as a result of this uh, collaboration in my presentation shortly.
Ian, uh, if you're here, please uh, try to stop, start webcasting again. We cannot hear you. Hello, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yes. How, how, were you able to hear me at the beginning or would you like me to start again? No, no, no. We just uh, lost you a few seconds ago. <laughs> Ah, just just on this slide. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. So yes, um, I was just mentioning that uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning forms a really important part of our latest range of assessments, and this is something that I'm going to be talking about in my presentation coming coming next. So this is me. I should have introduced myself at the beginning. I'm sorry about that, but my name is Ian Corley, and I'm the a global product manager based at Cambridge Assessment English, looking after some of our multi-level tests. I've been working for Cambridge for over 13 years now, and I've been involved in language teaching and assessment for more than 25 years. Uh, I'm an expert in teaching business English and business English assessments, and also have a lot of experience working with IELTS and our new online multi-level tests. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about LinguaSkill. LinguaSkill is a, ban a brand new testing product from Cambridge Assessment English. It's a very accurate test which allows us to give you really fast results. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that now. So LinguaSkill is a modular test. There is a core module of listening and reading. That's one test that goes together. And that test also incorporates grammar and vocabulary as well. There's also a separate writing and separate speaking module. And I'm going to give you more details about all these test modules and how they work together um, over the course of my presentation. LinguaSkill has two versions, both a general English and a business English version. We created these because we know that there are many situations where students and employees will want to study business English. If you're studying a, a business related course at university, you're more likely to want to do the business version or if you're already working in a corporate setting, that might be the best test for you. But we also know there are lots of uh, students and employees who would feel more comfortable and would find a general English test more relevant. And so we have both versions. Both versions are exactly the same in terms of the content and the question types and the levels of difficulty, but the difference is the context. One looks at general English and the other looks specifically at business English. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we've invested heavily in using artificial intelligence and machine learning in our exams. And we've created with LinguaSkill a multi-level test and what that means is that one test can uh, be used with students who have very low levels of English, pre-A1, all the way up to the highest levels, the C levels. And it's one test, and each student allows a unique testing experience. Every test is different. No two students will see the same questions in the same order. And also, we're very proud of the fact that all our qualifications including lingua skill, are available to students with special needs, students with hearing and sight impairment, other impairments. We're able to deal with those candidates and give them a special version of the test that, 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 that fits their needs. Like all our qualifications, and, and my, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Hisham, at the beginning mentioned a little bit about the, the Cambridge English scale and the CFR, the Common European Framework of Reference. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. You can see that we have a range of qualifications that are at specific levels of the CFR. So we've got examinations for school-aged children. As you can see, we have exams at pre-A1 all the way up to C2. We also have qualifications for adults. We have business versions of these qualifications. And these are all exams at a specific level. But over on the right side of the chart, you can see, um, let me use this lovely pointer. We have our, our multi-level tests. IELTS is the one that everybody knows about. It's the world's most popular English language assessment and is used for people who 
require a visa to work and study in an English-speaking country. But we also have linguist skill and another product called CEPT, the Cambridge English Placement Test, which I'll tell you a little bit about. What's great about linguist skill, as you can see here, as I mentioned, it can be used with students from pre-A1 all the way up to the highest levels. It doesn't differentiate currently between C1 and C2, but it does test students at C level. And you can see that it compares with IELTS. The addition of the Cambridge English scale that you can see here means that we've been able to break down every CEFR level into 20 points. And when I show you the reporting from Linguist Skill, you'll be able to see that we're able to give really granular accuracy of where somebody is within a CFR level. And it goes without saying, and I'm sure you're aware, that Cambridge Assessment English are one of the founding members of LTE, the Association of Language Testers of Europe, and we designed and developed the CFR and, of course, the Cambridge English Scale. CPT is a product that works very well with Lingua Skill. This is our placement test. It's a much quicker, shorter test, which is used specifically to place students on a course of study. So if you want to know what level of a what level a student has in a, in a very fast way so that they can begin their course, you can use this. It's a great a, a administrative tool. And then it can go hand in hand with Lingua Skill, which is a much more detailed test, much more detailed reporting. And it's great for a, a range of purposes, which I'll show you on the next couple of slides. So Lingua Skill is used both in the higher education and in the corporate setting. Here um, are some examples of how lingua skill is used in the higher education section. So it can be used for admissions. It can be used to show progress on a course. It can also be used to, to place students on a course, and it can be used at the end of a course as a test. It can be used for graduation purposes. It can also be used to determine which students are ready for a scholarship, and is also used for teachers who are teaching in the medium of English, but who might not necessarily be English teachers themselves, so for teachers studying on EMI courses. I also mentioned that it's used widely in the corporate sector as well. And you can see here that the main uses are for recruitment. Companies either advertise a particular grade on the CFR that they require students to have, when they're recruiting or they use it actually as a recruitment test as part of the recruitment process. It can also be used um, to determine which members of staff are ready for a promotion and also to identify the training needs that might be required. And I'm going to give you some really nice case studies at the end of my presentation to talk about this and also the last point here about language auditing and benchmarking which is really to determine the level of English that's required to do a specific job. While we're on the topic of uh, corporate training, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the importance of designing specific training programs and, and, and how we can help and how our assessments can help. So really the questions that uh, you should be thinking about when developing training courses are, are shown here on the screen. So how is the curriculum uh, aligned to international standards? Uh, how are the language levels and skills of your training course defined? How can you measure progress during training? And how can you identify the specific language gaps and make training more effective based around these? And how can you motivate staff to prepare for their tests? Well, simple answer here is having a, a, a great marriage between learning and assessment. We know that I've mentioned about positive washback and how using a, an assessment at the end of the course can have a positive effect on the development of the curriculum and also on the teaching styles and the lesson plans that the teachers create and also on the students themselves. Uh, having an assessment at the end of your course really does set a great sense of achievement for your students. They have something to, to focus on, something to aim for. They can also make training relevant and practical because you know exactly what you're going to have to achieve at the end of your course. They also allow you to show progress on that course and also helps you to set achievement goals. 
just wanted to talk a little bit more about motivation and how assessments as part of a training course can help with motivation as well. This is absolutely key. I know this is something that my, my, my colleague, Dr. Hisham, was talking about as well. He mentioned this, but motivation is the most important element of language acquisition. If we're not motivated to do something, as you know, it, in our daily lives, it's very, very difficult to do it. But good tests can have a, have a positive impact on this, both on intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, just to tell you a little bit about the two. So intrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from within, my own sense of achievement. So I want to learn English because it's, it's a goal that I've set for myself in life. It's something that I've always wanted to achieve. Extrinsic motivation comes from outside. So this will be pressure from your university to achieve a certain grade when you graduate from your course or pressure from your company to have a certain level of English in order to do your job. And assessments can help with both of these. Um, and it's important to note that even if you've got a great aptitude to learn a language or to learn anything else, a musical instrument, for example, is exactly the same. If you're not motivated, if you don't practice, if you don't have great resources, good teachers, etc., you're not going to be able to achieve uh, the highest level that you can. That's why I wanted to mention the importance of motivation in all of this and how assessments can help. So going back to lingua skill, I mentioned that because lingua skill is an adaptive test using artificial intelligence, it means that we can give you really rapid results the listening and reading test that I mentioned, the key key test, the core test, if you like, has results available as soon as the candidates finish it. Writing is also marked using uh, auto marking technology, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And so will my colleague Brona. Um, and results are back within four hours. Actually, we found that results can be back much more quickly than that, but um, four hours is the is the uh, is also the the maximum time that it will take. And the speaking test is currently marked by human raters. Um, students wear a headset with a microphone, as I am doing today. They speak to the computer, and uh, their answers are recorded and sent back to Cambridge, and they're marked by our human examiners there. We've also included a brand new results verification service. And what this does is allow institutions who want to check the results of candidates to make sure that their results are accurate. So it's a very simple website. You simply uh, enter the, the student's name and a few more details, and then you can access their results. And just to check that the results you see reported to you by the student are the real and real ones that have been recorded in Cambridge. So it gives you an extra level of security. The test is very easy to administer. I mentioned that it's online and we have a online portal that you can see over on the right hand side of the screen here. You as an institution, if you're going to use the test, would log on here. You purchase the test from here. You set up your students. You can access their results. And for students, they are given an access code, which they enter here and then they enter the test. All the students' results are saved in the same portal, and a student will have an online profile. So if they take more than one test, if they take the reading and listening test, and then perhaps the, the speaking test later or the writing test, they will be able to see all the tests that they've taken and all their results will be kept in one place, which makes it much easier for you to uh, analyze results. This is an example of the test report form that students receive. So you can see here, it's very nicely laid out. We've got lots of visuals here, as well as giving you information about the candidate, their name, their institution, date of birth, etc. You can see we start with a chart that gives an average score. So depending on which modules of the test they have taken, they will get an average score here averaging out their score across those modules. So you can see that they get a score on the Cambridge English scale, a CFR level, and then this fantastic bar chart which shows you exactly where they are within the CFR. And that 
possible because of the Cambridge English scale that I mentioned earlier. So you can see for this candidate, they are towards the top of B1. Underneath this average score, they also get scores for each individual test component that they've taken. Now, I mentioned that the reading and listening test is together, but they do get a separate score for listening and reading. And in the case of this student, they've also taken a speaking test. So you can see there that result there as well. And the same, they get a Cambridge English scale score, a CFR level, and the bar chart that shows you exactly where they are within the level. And the other great thing here is that they get some can-do statements. For, you may or may not be aware that um, Al ALTE, the Association of Language Testers of Europe, in addition to creating the, the CFR levels, have also created a, a range of can-do statements that go with those, which tell students exactly what they are able to do with their language at each CFR level and for each skill. And so these statements are related to the skill and also to the CFR level that they've achieved. In addition to that individual candidate report, there's also a group report which is available for institutions to use. This is particularly useful if you've got a, a cohort of students. Perhaps you've got a, a whole year's worth of students on a particular course who've taken the test at the same time. You can quickly analyze their results from here. This is exported as an Excel document as well as a PDF so that you can analyze the data. And also, um, it means that you can compare results year on year to see if there are any trends. Um, and it means that if you do use the, uh, the, uh, the lingua skill test as both a progress and exit test, it allows you to compare the results as well there. Okay, I've already mentioned this, this chart before about how we're aligned to the CFR. But I wanted to look specifically at the relationship between lingua skill and IELTS. I know that um, in, in, in some parts of the world, lingua skill um, is used uh, as a way of demonstrating readiness for IELTS. It can be used as a progress test on IELTS preparation courses. And like IELTS, it's a four skills multi-level test and the results are comparable. I wanted to finish today by just telling you a little bit about some of the uh, great learning resources that we've made available for LinguaSkill as well. This one that you can see here is a language course called Empower. This has been developed jointly by our partners, Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment English. This is a full course of learning. It comes with a, a textbook, there are online resources, an online workbook. There's an app to go with it as well. And this is a course of language study. However, all the uh, workbook components that you can see here, all the practice tests that form part of the Empower package have all been designed by Cambridge Assessment English. They're powered by the same technology as LinguaSkill and demonstrate the same question types that you'll find in the LinguaSkill exam. We've also developed an online course. This is 20 hours worth of learning. I should have mentioned that on the previous slide that the Empower course is 100 hours of learning, 100 hours of classroom-based learning plus the workbook. The online course is 20 hours of self-study. Uh, we are gonna be launching this in June. We're going to start with the listening and reading module and then we're going to be building speaking and writing modules as well. So this is great for students who want to practice by themselves at home, but there is also a class view. So if you want to use this as part of a course at a, at a university, the teacher is also able to log on and to see the progress of the students through the course. The third element is called the LinguaSkill Quick Guide. This is a great resource. It's a 10 hours worth of material here, and it's a great resource for students who just want to get a feel for the lingua skill test, how it works, the types of questions, what kind of reporting that they'll get. Um, this is a great resource for them. And then finally, those of you who are already aware of the Cambridge Assessment English website will know that we have lots and lots of free resources available for all our examination products. And, the LinguaSkill support page um, has plenty of practice tests that you can use, as well as some uh, great resources like Write and Improve and Speak and Improve, which use the same 
AI technology to help you develop your speaking and writing skills. So I just wanted to finish telling you a couple of case studies that I, that I, uh, I worked on personally. A few, uh, a few years ago, I had the uh, pleasure of coming to Moscow to undertake a, a benchmarking study with Sberbank. Um, Sberbank has a long-lasting relationship with Cambridge Assessment English, and we work, we work closely with their corporate university. Sberbank came to us because they wanted to determine the levels of English that were needed for a range of jobs within the bank. They wanted to use those so that they could test to see whether employees currently had the level of English required to conduct their job. And if they didn't, it was going to also going to be used to form uh, part of a, a, a course of study and lingua skill would form the exit test at the end of that course of study. So I spent a week in Russia meeting with various people at Spurbank, um, various senior managers and also uh, members of their training team and the HR team to look at those jobs, work with the Alta Can Do statements to determine exactly what level of English was required. And then we tested samples of, of staff using LinguaSkill to determine what level of English they had. We conducted a gap analysis and we were able to come up with a fantastic framework which the bank now uses uh, to set achievement standards um, for, for, their, um, for their staff when they are um, uh, attending English courses. We also conducted a similar study with, uh, with Air France. Air France are another long-standing uh, customer of ours and uh, they actually use uh, LinguaSkill as part of their training courses but also they use it to determine whether staff are ready to be promoted or not. So if you are a member of Air France cabin crew, you will attend an English language course. And if you would like to be promoted into a more senior position, you have to achieve a certain level using LinguaSkill. I think both the examples from Spurbank and Air France are excellent examples of how extrinsic motivation is used in learning and language testing to get the most out of the students. I just wanted to put this slide, there's a lot of information here, but just to tell you that LinguaSkill, although it's quite a new test, is already being adopted widely by a range of higher educational institutions, corporate clients, and government ministries. And that's really it from me before I pass over to my colleague, Brona. Um, I've really enjoyed talking. Ah, my colleague, Sue. <laughs> Sue, Hello. over to Hi. you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to, to thank you, Ian. Thanks very much. And um, just to say hello to everybody, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I had some uh, some technical issues, but uh, obviously um, Ian took over and uh, was seamlessly worked as part of the team. So thank you for that. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, I will stay online for the Q&A. So um, I will join Ian and Brona and Dr. Hisham and the rest of my colleagues. Um, thank you very much, Ian. I thought that was uh, a really interesting and expertly done. Thank you. Hello everybody, <laughs> um, my name's uh, Brona Rolf and uh, before we get going just to briefly introduce myself, um, I'm um, an assessment group manager at uh, Cambridge Assessment, Cambridge English Assessment um, and that means uh, that I lead a group of content experts, uh, content spe test content specialists who help create the tests and the material. And um, I also work with our colleagues in research and thought leadership um, to try and help create what the content of the tests. So I thought today it would be useful for you to hear a little bit about the tests and obviously with the tests, the, um, the, the science behind it, the, the AI and the adaptive algor algorithms that we use to create the secure, reliable test. I'm sorry, just I'm going to, if you, uh, one minute, I'm just trying to remember how to navigate this, if you were... Oh. Excuse me. 
Julia, I'm struggling to find. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, I found it. It's okay. Rona, did you find the? <laughs> Very okay. Fantastic. Can you so change pardon? the slides? Can you change, change the, the slides, slides now? now? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. I was just struggling. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, just uh, uh, before I get on to the, the content of the slides, just to let you know what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a general overview of the technology um, that we use in the test, um, how we use it, how it's been trialled, and then I'm going to go through details of each part of the test and show how the, that technology has been integrated and uh, how we can use it to maximise the effectiveness of the test. So. OK, so very first of all, uh, lingual skill test, reliable test you can trust. When we talk about trialing, um, from my point of view, there are several different points of trialing to make sure that we are getting the best quality product out there. So the first thing that we always need to do is if we have a task that you know, that, or a particular question type, we have to trial that. Um, but then that's not enough. We have to then trial uh, to find out that the test, the, the questions and the different types of questions all work together and to create a, a solid test. So we have to trial the tests at the very theoretical stage of it. Um, for some of the technology that we're using, we then have to go further and trial that the technology that we're using works with the test construct that we've got. And then finally, we have to move into a business as usual sort of trialing, which it's not, a, it's not enough to just say that once we've trialed something once, that we can continue to ensure the quality of that material. So anything new that we're producing, we're constantly trialing to make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, the lingua skill, the lingua skill tests have been not this is aside from the business as usual trial trialing all the other parts of the trialing I've talked about they've been uh, trialed on speakers of over 40 different languages in um, about 50 countries but this is this is increasing all the time um, and we our point purpose in trialing is always to try and satisfy the four points on the screen that the test is valid that has validity so that we are sure what validity we are sure what we're measuring so when we say that this is a b2 result it is a b2 result and the reliability is that this b2 result is uh, valid for you um, today and if you took it uh, uh, your candidates took it again in another six months the the result they could they receive is as good as the one that you have received so it goes across time um, and we also the other things that as Cambridge assessment as a whole not just lingual skill but all, all our tests which is really important to us that the impact of our test is positive this is referring to what Ian's already talked about the positive wash pack back so that by doing the test it is creating like a a, a um, a, oh, not a vicious circle. <laughs> I've just lost my word. Um, a, a, a virtuous circle that by doing the test, it's improving performance as well. So, and this moves into the final point of the practicality that we want the test to be practical, that what they're being tested on is, a, is something that is, makes sense for the world that we live in. It's not just a theoretical test of language. It's some, it means that they has a, a positive washback in the real world and it reflects the reality that they're in. Um, for lingua skill, um, uh, we have, in the reading and listening test, we use advanced computer-based testing. Um, Cambridge English has been using um, adaptive testing for some years now, first starting back in uh, some early prototypes in the 90s. Um, one of our biggest products was um, Bullets Online, which was launched in 2008. And the algorithm that we're using in Lingua Skill is very much based on the, the knowledge and experience that we've gained over those years and, and Bullets. And this is a little graph to try and demonstrate what we mean by adaptive testing. Um, so it's using sophisticated algorithms to ensure every candidate receives a unique version of the test tailored, tailored to their ability level. So 
Your average candidate will be dropped in about A2 level, as you can see on the screen. Um, and then what questions they are then faced with depends on their ability to answer the questions that are uh, put in front of them. So um, they, they get the first question right. So they get one that's slightly more difficult. By, that doesn't mean they jump really high up the, to the B1 levels. It's incremental. We're slowly testing out the candidates to find out where their ability lies. When they start uh, to get things wrong, then the ability, uh, the, the question, the question, next question they're given is a little back to where they started. What um, it does is it keeps moving the candidate up and down through the CFR levels until it finds where is the limit of their ability and this way that we can be sure what level they really are. In the example you've seen, this is just a very small snapshot of the overall experience, but you can see that um, we, you, the, ca the candidate goes up and down through the level. So maybe the question three that you see on the chart, maybe they got it wrong just because they made a silly mistake. That doesn't mean that's it, they're not B1. They get another opportunity if they keep getting things right to, to go up. Um, and it also means that candidates who just get the lucky guess, which happens if you have a multiple choice question, that's not enough. They have to, they keep on having to prove their level until the computer algorithm feels that they have been, that they've provided enough evidence for us to be able to calculate what their level of English is. I'll go a bit, I will talk a little bit more about the adaptive test when I talk about reading and listening a bit later. Um, the other part of the technology that we used the, uh, for our advanced computer based testing is the automarker. Um, so for our writing test at the right now, we uh, not the, the the test is not being marked by humans. It's being marked by uh, our auto marker, which is um, th is something that we have developed with our partners at Alta, who Ian mentioned in his com um, talk. And these are a group of computational linguists. Um, applied linguists, computer engineers who have created this algorithm to be able to mark writing automatically. The advantage to the candidates and to centres is that the results are much, much quicker than if we were using human examiners. Um, it's an, and it's the worry obviously is because there's a fear still out there of that AI and uh, technology is that it's not going to be as good as a human. We have done extensive trialing. Um, I'm just looking at the figures here for you. Um, we trialed, uh, once we had the technology in place, we wanted to make sure that it worked for our product. So we trialed the writing test on nearly 4,000 candidates in 23 countries and across all CFR levels. And then we did lots of analysis, particularly my colleagues in um, RTL, Research and Thought Leadership. And we have calculated what is the agreement of the automarker with humans. And the automarker is as uh, reliable as a group of expert examiners. For us to, to make that a little bit clearer, um, I hope, uh, if you have, we had five expert examiners in a room, well, we had more than that, but if you just took a group of the best five, um, they would their reliability between each other about what they would award a script was somewhere between 0.88 and 0.95, sorry, 0.82 and 0.95. And um, the automarker is, has a reliability uh, statistic of 0.88. So it's right in the middle of a group of expert examiners. The advantage of an automarker is if we give one script to a group of different humans, no matter how um, well they think they are, how good they are as a group of examiners, they all have um, different uh, strengths and weakness. Some mark a little harsher, some mark a, a little more leniently, some are just erratic because they've had a bad day, they're a bit tired. But the automarker always marks consistently. And that's the huge advantage of it. 
Um, again, I'll come back to talking a little bit more about the automarker when I talk about the writing tests itself. So to move on to the actual different tests that we've got, the first, um, the first skill that I'm going to talk about or skills are the reading and listening test. Um, the reading and listening test um, ideally shouldn't have a timer. It's uh, as it's an adaptive test, the algorithm, the algorithm um, finishes once it has established what the level of the candidate is. But on average, that's a, between 60 to 85 minutes for a candidate. Um, it could be the, the some candidates take a bit longer because uh, they're a very high level. So we have to get through more material. Some candidates take a little bit longer because their behavior is a bit more erratic. They've just had one too many lucky guesses. Um, and the some candidates just get take a long time because they take a long time. It's their personality type. However, as institutions, you may want to say, we need to get these people in and out of a room. So we do have the option of having a timer. But the ideal situation is not to place a timer and the test will naturally come to an end once the algorithm has established the level of the candidates. So the number of questions they receive is, um, is variable. Uh, some candidates, the more erratic candidates, will see more. The candidates maybe at the really low level of the test will see fewer because they, you know, we are, we are marking down to pre-A1. And so those ones who are really down the bottom of the CFR levels um, will run out of questions to ask them if they can't answer anything correctly. But it, it really depends. There's no hard and fast rule. If you finish quickly doesn't mean you did badly. Maybe you're just very consistent. The type of questions that we um, have in the test, uh, if you want to see more details and have examples of this, as Ian has said, there's lots of examples on our public website. We have sample tests and we have practice tests for free that you can have a look at. So we have for reading, we have a read and select ta ta tasks. Um, these can be short or long. Oh, these are the short ones. Um, short text, three possible multiple choice answers. Gap sentences, which are towards the use of English or grammar type questions, which we're also testing it within the reading part of the test. Um, we have multiple choice gap fills, which tend to be vocabulary style questions. You'll have a text. There are five gaps in the text, four options for each, three or four options, depending on the level. You have to choose the correct one to fit the text, which is a mixture of vocabulary and grammar. Um, open gap fills, you have to type in the word that's missing, which tends to focus the test constructors to cover the, the grammar um, ne um, points that needs to be covered. Um, and then we have extended reading, which is trying to get as many of the reading skills that we can cover in the test construct. This is normally about five questions, though some of the sh we have some shorter ones of two questions and some of as long as six. But they're just reading comprehensions, so we can really dig in deep to the candidate's reading ability. Um, moving on for the listening test, um, they look a bit different, but we have two main types of questions. We have listen and select, which are short questions. Some of those are very much based on written prompts on screen. Some of those are based on graphics. Um, so for the lower level, when you get to the higher levels, they we don't have as many of those. But for lower level candidates, you might be hearing, for example, somebody talking about what the weather's like today. And there's three pictures. Um, but this there's a there's a huge variety of t different uh, uh, topics that they could be talking about, especially in the general. And then the extended listening, it's similar to the reading. There are five um, longer listening texts, which on which there are five or six questions, multiple choice questions. Um, so for the uh, listening test, for the adaptive test, I've got some questions I'm often asked. These are the sorts of questions I often get asked. Um, how long is the test? So it is 60 to 85 minutes, but as I said before, we cannot say for certain. Um, what are the features of the test? Well, the features of the test, I've talked about the different task types that you get. Um, it's also very thorough test construct. Um, one of the points to remember is that this is a very reliable test. So uh, an adaptive test generally is considered 
um, a much more reliable way of judging someone's level of English than a linear test because of this idea of, as I spoke before, about calling out lucky guesses. Um, and it's as the algorithm develops and the adaptive algorithm develops, it fine tunes. It probably quite early on could decide that you are somewhere in the B range, for example, but then it narrows the questions down till it's absolutely certain where you are in the B range. And then the score that we can give is we can tell you your B2, for example, but we can also give you a Cambridge English score, which will be able to show you where in B2 you actually fit. So uh, in terms of the reliability of tests, please help yourselves and look at the Cambridge English website to get more details. But for the reading test, we say it has a, uh, sorry, the listening test is a 0.92 reliability. The reading test has a 0.94 reliability. And the reason that we combine reading and listening together is if you combine both scores uh, together, the reliability of test is 0.96. This means it's a very highly reliable test. Generally speaking, 0 0.90 is considered a, a pretty good, a reliable test. We're talking about a test that can, um, be, can say that it's reliable to 0.96. So I'm sure you'll, you'll agree that's a really positive thing to say. Um, how quickly are results delivered? Well, the algorithm knows the result of the candidate as soon as the test comes to an end. And it's up to the uh, institution to decide do they want to issue that result or do they want the candidates to see that result immediately? So both options are possible. If, for an example, your institution would like to, um, or any institution would like to keep the results to themselves and issue the results at one time, that can be done. If, however, people are doing it at home or wherever, they want them to be able to see what their uh, result is straight away, that can be done too. Okay, moving on to the writing test. Currently, the writing test takes exactly 45 minutes. It's not adaptive, but it does mark from pre-A1 to C1 or above. There are two parts to the test, um, and those. the reason we've got two parts is to try and um, allow the ability that they allow the candidates from pre A1 to C1 have a, an opportunity to show their ability. So part one is an email, and uh, it should, should candidates should spend about 15 minutes on it, and uh, they should write. They have some prompts they have to respond to, and they should write at least 50 words. I'll go back and talk to the, the uh, talk about why we say at least because this is quite different from many of our other. Um, exams. I'll talk about that in a minute. Part two um, is more of an essay or letter type style thing. Um, it's about 100 and weighted, they'll again at least 180 words. Again there are some bullet points to respond to um, and they we should spend about half an hour on this. We do expect that the lower level candidates will probably be putting most of their effort into the part one because they'll find that more accessible but we have the part two to allow the um, stronger candidates the opportunity to shine. Um, so uh, the at least is because normally nearly all other exams that are human marked, you have a question of what the maximum word count is. When we're dealing with an auto marker, what we need is the minimum word count. It's not to say that if people write less than that, that they won't get a mark, but there's less evidence for the auto marker to calculate a response. A maximum word count is usually for the, uh, the good of the examiners because they don't want to, they have a limit of how much time they're to, to look at these scripts. The auto marker doesn't have this problem. All it wants is to try and find as much evidence as possible. And it's trying to look for um, evidence of uh, grammar, vocabulary, cohesion, um, that, uh, that the, the, the text runs naturally and that there's a range. It's not about getting everything right. It has, isn't it that the, the candidate must have the absolute most perfect answer with no mistakes because perhaps they might do that, but they're not really pushing themselves and showing a full range of vocabulary. So the automarker is looking for all this. So if you're looking for range, the more that you write, the better because it has more evidence on which to, to pull to say what your level is. 
So if I move on to the next slide, how is the test marked? I think we've established it's, it's auto marked. Um, now, how the candidates achieve the best possible score. Um, we, um, the candidates need to demonstrate the, the absolute best of their ability. Um, it is possible to answer the questions in a very simple way because we are trying to cater for candidates across all the CFR, but the strong candidate will push themselves a bit further. They'll give more. It's, um, um, I've often used the analogy of it's, uh, and this is as a mother of teenagers, it's uh, as <laughs> your teenage response can be quite minimal sometimes. And what you want them to do is to expand. So these, the same goes in the writing here. We don't want them to just say the bare minimum. We want them to give as much as they can in 45 minutes because we're just looking for evidence. So how can candidates prepare for the test? We have the write and improve, um, which is based on similar but not the same technology as the, the writing auto marker, but it, it helps candidates. Truly, for any writing test, it doesn't matter whether you're writing online or writing on paper, writing. So if you use any uh, course book that helps you to improve your writing, that's good. Anything will do. However, um, I think Ian's already talked about Empower and uh, the other the materials that we're creating this is what you need to do people just need to to practice writing or be taught writing in ever, any format and to the main thing to tell them when you're teaching them is push yourself don't try and limit yourself um they're the if the more they write it has to be correct as well but it needs to be a, um not necessarily everything sticking into very simple use of tenses and and vocabulary more the more is better how quickly are results delivered um the, the results can be through very very quickly we do say uh, two working days just to just make sure that we can do any quality assurance checks or um, make sure that everything has come through in time but the truth is that most can most results will be available um, much more quickly than that but we just need to be sure that they are they will be because that auto marker <clears throat> excuse me our auto mark our auto marker is is external to our platform so results are being put input by the candidate into our system then piped out to the auto marker we receive the mark back and then issue the results out so that this is why we insist on just a, a little bit of time just to make sure that it all comes through but this has been improved on all the time um i think we'll be able to report shortly about how f much faster we can get that done um uh, okay the speaking test um so the speak the current speaking test has uh, five different parts to it um and the general idea of this is it it becomes more challenging the uh the fur the more you go through the test so the first part of the test can get eight questions they're very personal sort of well very personal they're personals themselves are all based on information they will automatically know the first two questions for example aren't even marked that's the what's your name where do you come from and that's just a get people used to being able to speak into a microphone and not not speaking to a human and then the questions so the general sort of questions you'd expect about free time hobbies jobs etc um and it's it's quite if they become even they become a slightly more challenging because they might need to use more future tense or past tenses as they go through part tense part two uh, the candidate reads eight sentences aloud. This is very much a pronunciation exercise. The, the, again, the sentences become gradually more difficult as you go through the eight of them. The first ones are quite simple. By the third one, it's requiring a lot more fluency um, and intonation to get them correct. Uh, the part three, the candidate's given a topic to talk about for about a minute. They are allowed 40 seconds for preparation. They've told what the topic is. They have about a minute to prepare a few things and then they just have to speak. Uh, um, doesn't They have to try and fill the minute. If they overrun the minute, this is not a problem. But again, I go back to my teenage point. They can't just stop. The idea again, 
this isn't the speaking isn't currently auto marked but the examiners also this is their one opportunity to hear what this candidate is capable of so they must never assume that that examiner knows what what they can do really and it's just their pronunciation they need to get as much evidence as possible part four uh, the candidate is given some graphics and again similar to part five they are asked to they've got a minute for preparation and then they have to talk for a minute and then part five they are told that they're this is uh, to try and feel to make them a little bit more spontaneous responses a little bit more they're told they're going to talk about for example um, with their future career plans for lingua skill business and then they hear um, five different questions and they have to respond naturally to them they have a little bit of time to think about the subject area before the questions appear okay so at the present the uh, test the, the the results that the candidates received are based on examiner's marks. So all the audio files that are created by the candidates are sent to our examiners and our examiners who we have certificated and who we monitor and we train and monitor, they mark the test. Um, obviously, because we've got examiners, this slows the turnaround uh, time a little bit. Um, it's too, it takes about two UK working days to ensure that we've got all the examiners to mark the parts of test. We have at least two examiners marking one person. So any opinion is not based on one examiner's viewpoint. We've got at least two of them, if not more, marking the different parts of the test and the, the scores are combined. Uh, this is to try and overcome the problems of, you know, examiners behaving erratically. Um, what we are doing now, though, is the we are training our speaking auto marker which is being created well has been created but we're just getting gaining further evidence before we fully auto mark the tests um, and that's been created by our partners at alta with us um, how can candidates achieve the best possible score again like writing the idea is they have to prove what they can do don't they, they can't just speak and stop they have to keep talking and give as much evidence as possible. It doesn't matter if they get cut off. Um, it is something that needs a, the teachers need to help candidates with because they probably feel that if they had a face-to-face -face, um, examiner that um, they wouldn't be cut off. The truth is, if you went to any of our other exams, the examiners that the face-to-face -face examiners are told this candidate should only speak for one minute and they will more politely than a computer wind them up to stop talking after a minute obviously in a computer there's just more of a that's the end of your minute and it's up it, that's not important we're not interested in whether they've fully answered the question what we're interested in is their language ability so they need to try and Prove, give as much evidence of how good they are in the, the windows that are given to them. Um, how quickly are the results delivered? I think I might just answer that. It's within two UK working days. And I should say for speaking and writing, like the reading and listening, it's in the gift of the institution whether those results are directly issued to the candidates or the institution decides they take control of the results and pass them on where necessary. Um, I think that is actually the end of my, oh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, that's actually the end of um, my uh, section of the webinar. But I wonder if um, Sue and Ian would like to join us. And I think Yulia is going to put some of the questions you may have had to us and we can choose the correct person to answer those. Anybody there? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, Ian. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yes, you. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, is Sue here? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, thank you for your presentations. Now we know a lot about lingua skill about artificial intelligence about automarker so we we have some questions uh from the participants and um in just a second um 
So uh, the first question is, um, can we use lingua skill as indication for preparation for Cambridge exams? Who wants to take that? Um, Go on, it can be used for, it, it's, it's aligned to the same Cambridge English scale, so you can help. But I think it, if you're placing people into exam classes, you would be using the Cambridge placement test. Um, the, the, it's, that, that would be a better use, I think. Ian, would you agree, Sue? Yeah? Yeah, but the, it's not for preparation, you know, lingual skill isn't preparation for um, uh, Cambridge English qualifications. It's, it's, it's for a different use. Thank you very much. Yes, I would, I would uh, reiterate that as well. Yeah, Bruno, I think it depends on the use case. So um, you, you, they can be used together, but they can be used separately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is, um, uh, how corporate clients uh, can use this test? Okay. So a um, couple, of, couple of answers there. We, we, we have different sales models. So... Uh, corporate clients, if they think that they are going to use uh, a high number of tests every year, they can work directly with us and we can have an agreement with them. Or if they are only thinking about using a small number of tests, we have a network of agents. We have network of agents throughout Russia who they could purchase tests from. Thank you, Ian. After the webinar, we will be happy to share the materials and contact details of our uh, existing agents here in Russia. So everybody who wants uh, to find more about the um, uh, test, about uh, our cooperation, so they will be able to contact us or our agents for more information. So we got another question. If compared with other online tests, what is the best thing about lingua skill? So there are a lot of different online tests, uh, some placement tests. What's the main thing about lingua skill? What's the difference? We got this question a few times. Sue, would you like to do that one? Or do you want me to take it? Hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Great. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, yes, well, I'd be very happy to answer that. Um, so I think it really goes back to what Brona was saying in, in a lot of her presentation, really. I think that there are lots, of course, there are lots of um, assessment products that work um, online these days, and, and every day there, there is more and more. But I think that we understand at Cambridge that what we have embedded into the skill is all of the learning that we have um, over you know, I mean, I really mean hundreds of years of assessment that so we have a, um, um, our methodology um, of assessment is embedded into lingual skills. So it's a combination of having the um, assessment expertise together with the sophistication of machine learning. And that really does make um, lingual skill a unique proposition. Um, and it, it's that combination. Um, you know, it's based on all of our um, assessment uh, expertise that we have had in or continue to have in other um, assessment um, solutions such as our Cambridge English qualifications. Uh, and that really does mean that it's a, it's a super powerful tool to, for, for, for everyone to use. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I hope now it, uh, it, it, it became clear for our participants, what's the difference between lingua skill and uh, uh, online uh, tools to um, like placement tests or other online tests? So, Ian, there is a question about IELTS. Um, you mentioned mm -hmm. the difference, but could we repeat it once again, please? What's the difference between lingua skill and IELTS? Yeah, Not okay. Similarities, but uh, th this. Uh, uh, tests are completely different so please could you yeah of course I mean there are a number of differences I suppose the the easiest way to think about it is that currently if you want to uh, get a visa to work or study in an English speaking country um, IELTS will allow you to do that uh, lingua skill currently doesn't do, doesn't have that that uh, level of 
of recognition. Um, but also, uh, you have to think about the ways that lingua skill can be used. It's it's online. It's multi-level. It's very flexible. Okay, it's much cheaper. So if you are looking for, if you've got students who want to graduate or place them in a course of study, or if you want to use it as a progress test or as a recruitment test, then I would say that. Um, lingua skill is a much more flexible tool that can be used for that process. But if you're looking to go overseas and you need a visa, then IELTS is the test for you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Brona, I think this question is for you. So what are the criteria in checking the writing by machine? So you mentioned uh, writing assessment, but uh, could you uh, clarify on it, please? Okay, so the uh, writing assessment. Oh, I've got quite fair feedback. Ian, could you just take your mic off? Sorry. Um, the uh, writing is it's it's the best thing I would recommend. First of all, is to understand it more in more detail. Is to look at the video and the information that we've got on our public website. Um, however, it marks on grammar, it marks on vocabulary, and this is at uh, word level and at sentence level and at paragraph level. And it also marks for cohesive devices. It's trained um, on low, uh, thousands, thousands of responses that have been marked by humans and then the information has been fed into the writing auto marker and annotated. Um, and then it, it looks to see what is considered different features of A1 speech, uh, sorry, A1 writing or B1 writing and so on. And when it's gained enough evidence, it then starts pointing to the level that it, it, the, that sample of writing test most equates to. Um, it would be, it, it, this is a very simplistic way of putting it and I would re strongly recommend that you go to the, the public website and have a look at the video which I think really explains it very well and you've got time to take it in in more detail. Does that help? Yes, thanks, thanks a lot. I think, um, uh, well, this, um, this is a very detailed and uh, understandable answer. So we will share the links to the website to these videos and I, I hope that uh, in case people still have some questions, they will contact us and we will send uh, our um, uh, responses by by email and we'll um, it, yeah I've just got one other response that they might find useful on the website we've also created um, it taken tar um, which might help explain it and put it into context we've got um, a series of scripts of uh, that that went through the auto marker and uh, we've given them to an examiner to try and help explain why that person got b1 or a2 or whatever and I think it's a a much easier way of understanding how the auto marker works and it arrives at the results. Thank you, Brona. Very useful uh, resource. That's true. So, um, as um, as I can see, uh, the, um, let me have a quick look at the questions. So, um, Oh, uh, there is a uh, there is a question about um, um, well um, expiration date of the certificate. So first question is uh, the certificate. Is there any certificate? And uh, um, mm, well, uh, what's about the expiry date? Uh, so how long how long uh, can uh, people use this certificate? Can can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah, uh, can you hear me, everybody? Yes, yes, yeah. Ian. Okay, I, uh, my video's gone now. Um, okay, so so we at Cambridge don't set an expiry date for the qualification. It depends on the institution that is that is that is using it to set that. So, for example, you may decide as an in institution that the test has um, a validity of two years, for example, but that's up to you to decide that. That isn't something that, that, that we decide centrally. And in terms of, of the reporting that, that you get, um, you get a test report form 
from the system that's generated and printed from the system and that's the one that I showed you in the presentation with the bar graphs on it so that's the test report form rather than the certificate that you get thank you thank you Ian yeah we will share the uh, slides the presentations with the participants so uh, I think it will help to have a look at this test report form to understand uh, what's the difference between the certificates what uh, information is provided on this test report form and uh, uh, sure it will be helpful so we, we get a lot of questions about the price Dear participants, dear attendees of our webinar, we will send the information about the price and um, uh, further cooperation with Cambridge Assessment English in our email, so you will be able to um, get all this information uh, and uh, we will discuss uh, personally. Uh, some uh, organizations can become our agents some organization, uh, organizations can become our channel partners and uh, there is a possibility now for individuals to take this test even from home um, because now we have a um, um, good proctoring system here in Russia. We have signed an agreement with uh, a company and uh, when we finish our conference I will share a video about this proctoring company to understand how, how it works how proctoring works and how people can take uh, such tests from home uh, anytime they want. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Sue, Ian, Brona. It was a great pleasure to, to see you here today. Thank you for your support. Thank, thank you for your experience. And uh, it's a great honor for us uh, uh, to be here with you today. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank yeah, you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, so, so uh, now I'm happy to introduce um, Olive Tina. Uh, I will upload uh, the slides. Um, uh, uh, so now we are going to speak about um, experience of uh, Russian universities that already use lingua skill and um, Olive Tina represents MIFI, one of the most um, famous Russian universities. Uh, can you hear me, Olive Tina? Yes, yes, I can hear yes. you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Can you change the slides? Does everything work for you? Let's, let's check it. Yeah, I think so. Fantastic. So I stop webcasting and giving the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, first of all, uh, hello everyone, and I'm really happy to participate in this webinar. Thank you very much for inviting us, and I'm very happy to share our experience with you. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, I'm, my name is Aliftina Strailova, and I'm a Deputy Head of Foreign Languages Department at MIFI. Uh, well, MIFI is uh, a National Research Nuclear University. And uh, basically, our um, students are future physicists, future engineers, future IT specialists. Um, in some cases, uh, that they are connected with uh, economic security and so on. Uh, so, you, as you can see, English is not their major subject. Uh, but anyway, it is still a very important subject. And I will uh, uh, tell you a few more words about that. So. Uh, English at MIFI is um, divided into two main directions, general English and English for specific purposes. Uh, and uh, traditionally at MIFI, uh, ESP was the most important focus. So um, as, as I've said, our, future, well, our students are future uh, physicists and so on. Uh, it was considered for them that the most important part for them in English was to uh, speak physics in English, so speak about physics. But uh, lately, uh, there has been a change, and uh, our first of all, our partners who are future employers of our students, and as well as the students themselves, uh, they um, wanted us to devote more time and to devote more attention to the general English. 
because as they put it, uh, you can learn ESP much faster and much better, much more efficient when your general English is good. And when students come to our university, uh, when uh, we start working with them, their level of English can be very different. It's, uh, uh, and uh, there are many students uh, with a low level of the English language. Uh, so the first two years uh, of the English language uh, teaching is focused on leveling them all up. And um, yeah, uh, and then when they more or, have, more or less have something about uh, an intermediate level, uh, we move on in later years, and especially when they have their master program or postgraduate programs, we move more to ESP and we focus more on ESP or academic vocabulary as well, academic English. Um, so um, the first two years, as I've said, this is mo mostly general English and they have from two to six hours a week. It depends on the year. It depends uh, on the group. Um, so yeah, most of the English they have during their second year. This is uh, the, uh, so to say, the biggest part of English. Uh, for some reasons, we only started dividing our groups according to the English uh, level only a year ago, but it really helps. It really uh, obviously makes our work more efficient, but we still have this problem of mixed groups, so with, uh, groups with um, mixed levels of student, of, of the level of English. And uh, yeah, I think that many of the universities, many of the organizations have this problem. So when it is difficult uh, to, uh, to level up the students in a group. We also have special groups for beginners, so for those students who only started learning English at our university, starting with the alphabet. Yeah, usually there are students uh, who come from the schools where they didn't have English at all. They perhaps had German or French or no foreign language, unfortunately. And we also have uh, advanced groups, uh, so, uh, students who come and they already have very good English and with them we can uh, focus on ESP sooner, so we uh, have ESP with them and uh, sometimes translation and interpretation. Well, that's all about uh, uh, English at MIFI. Uh, so now let's talk about the testing itself, uh, the lingua skill at MIFI. Uh, how it started, what was the reason? Uh, the first uh, reason was the push from our uh, business partner, who is also a potential employer. So uh, they were those who talked about um, needing uh, future employees with a high level of English, at no lower than uh, intermediate. And uh, the first goal for us was to assess the level of the English language of the graduates. So what we receive in the end, yeah, what is the, the, um, the level that we get. So that's uh, when we had this task, when we had this goal, um, we then had to choose a testing system. And uh, our testing system had several requirements. First of all, because uh, these were graduate students who were um, being assessed, being tested, uh, the problem was that not all of them were at this time in Moscow because they have their practice, they have their internships. So they could be anywhere around Russia or abroad. So, and it made it obvious that we had to have an online testing for them. Uh, second requirement was uh, that uh, it needed, because we, we wanted it to have a, as a real exam, so it, uh, the testing needed to have all skills uh, assessed, you know, including reading, listening, speaking and writing. And not many of the testing systems right now have this type of, uh, have, have this type of comprehensive testing. Uh, one more requirement was that uh, it needed to be multi-level because we didn't want them just to see whether they're intermediate or not. We needed to uh, analyze where they, where they go, uh, where are they after they graduate. So if it was lower, where lower, uh, what level was, uh, was it? If it was higher, then once again, what level? Uh, and once again, lingua skill, it uh, fit uh, these requirements uh, really well. And uh, the last one, very important requirement, was that uh, the students should, shouldn't be able to cheat, uh, which they love to do, as you know. And that's why the proctoring system that was used, uh, yeah, it, once again, fit our requirements perfectly. Uh, so, 
Next point was the selection of students. As it was our first experience, we used uh, this test uh, to um, motivate our students, uh, or mot it's more to say, to reward our good, our good students. So for this first experience, we chose uh, students that we expected to had uh, a rather high level of English. Yeah, so as for the testing, um, in general, Everything went fine, uh, no, no, not very many problems. So here I just uh, mentioned some of them. First was testing period. The first testing period that our partner gave to us was a little bit short for us. We needed to, because once again, they had their practices, they had their internships, and they were otherwise very busy with other subjects and so on. We needed a rather long period of time, approximately a month, for them to have this opportunity to connect and to pass the testing online. And actually, this problem was solved really quickly. No problem with that. Uh, so next was the connection with students. And next two are somehow, uh, next two points are in, uh, interconnected. Because once again, they were far away. Uh, and uh, they were not our students anymore, meaning that they did not have English classes anymore at this point, uh, at their last year. So it was uh, like uh, literally very, very difficult to connect with them, to find them, to get that feedback, yes, to get that agreement to participate. Um, the second reason was that testing was not uh, uh, obligatory, so didn't, they didn't have to do that. And when, you know, that when students don't have to do that, they usually don't do that. So once again, we try to motivate them. Uh, we once again position this testing as a reward rather than test to know yeah, whether you're good or bad at English. And uh, yes, uh, thank you. thanks once again to our partners. They also helped us uh, a lot uh, at this point. Yeah, so what were the results? Yeah, the results were that 110 students and teachers were tested. And I was one of uh, the teachers who actually took this test, passed it. And uh, I can tell you, uh, I also know the feedback from my colleagues who also took that test, that uh, we all found it really satisfying, really adequate, and the results that we received were the results that we actually expected. And it was a test that took some effort. So for example, when I was um, doing it, it was really difficult. Uh, I also passed some, some years ago proficiency test. So it was, the level was very, very close, I would say. And when we talked to some students, well, I will uh, say a, a little bit more words about that later. But anyway, when we talked with the students who had lower level, so their tests, their tasks were not as difficult. So they were a little bit easier for them. Right, so what we expected uh, uh, to get from this testing, because once again, uh, that were um, those were students uh, who were good students uh, with a high level of English. And we expected to have 100% of intermediate and above level. Uh, what we had were 97%, which is very good, I think. And um, uh, those people who did not get uh, the expected level, uh, the reason was mostly technical one. So it was more about uh, microphone not working, headphones not working, so things like that. So it was not about their level of English or uh, some tasks that they found too difficult. Uh, so general feedback from uh, the students was really positive uh, and uh, they said that it was adequate, uh, that the tasks were adequate and they also said that it took some effort so it really felt like an exam, not something that you could do during you know, 15 minutes of free time that you have. No, it, it took an effort from them um, and it was also uh, important for us uh, and they said that it was like a real exam and uh, they agreed with their results. So they said that the results that they received, they were quite what they expected. Uh, and we also had uh, one more online test team going on <laughs> simultaneously at the time. And uh, yeah, in comparison, of course, lingua skill was uh, uh, got all the best and positive results. Uh, right, uh, so the possible future of this testing on our point of view now at our university, what it could be. Uh, so uh, we are thinking about testing all, our great, all of our graduates in the future using this test because I think, I think that it really shows the level of the English language well. 
Perhaps one more way we, we could use it at our university uh, could be uh, testing to check the level of the general English. So after the two years when we focus on the general English, uh, before we focus on ESP. So, so we could see if our students were really ready uh, to have ESP class, more ESP classes than general English classes, whether their uh, general level of English was enough. And also, I think that it could be some kind of an alternative, or at least a part of the English uh, exam, especially uh, when we see what is happening in, right now in the world. We can see that, yeah, it, it could be used as an alternative or a part of the English exam. Yeah, so meaning that uh, having it as uh, an exam with the general English and then ESP, academic or whatever, would be done in a different way. Right, so thank you very much. That's it. That's all that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, so you're very welcome with the questions. Yep, uh, perhaps Yulia could help me yep, with uh, the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Alina. Thanks a lot. So uh, there are some questions. Uh, well, the first question was, uh, how many students are there in the groups? Well, it depends. Uh, uh, we, of course, the ideal, the ideal group okay, is something about you. 12 people. Uh, but it depends, so, um, uh, I, I think, as in many okay. of our universities, sometimes it's up to uh, 18. Well, we, mm. we put... <laughs> We put our foot in if, if it's no, more than No, I think that we don't have any uh, any more questions. Uh, thank you very much for for sharing your experience. Uh, and um, well, please uh, uh, stay with us till the end of the conference. Probably there will be some questions uh, after after the next session. So now I'm uh, happy to. Well, thank you very much. That was a uh, pleasure. Thank you, Anna Lipina. Um, Anna Anna is. Um, Head of English Language Department at uh, RANIPA, one, uh, one of Russian universities, Russian Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Anna, can you, can you hear me? Uh, well, fine. So, uh, can you see your presentation? Can you see your slides? Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, perfectly well. Yeah, 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 just a second. Yeah, now I can change the slides. Yeah. Um, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for staying till the end of the conference. Um, I would like to express this gratitude because I know that right now we're living in turbulent times and um, we're on the lockdown and we're sitting in front of our laptops for a lot of hours, so thank you. Um, today I would like to share our experience of collaboration with uh, Cambridge uh, Assessment English. And uh, to begin, then, let me introduce myself once again. Uh, I'm Lipina Ann, I'm the head of the English Language Department at the Faculty of Economic and Social Sciences um, at Russian Presidential Academy. But before telling you a little bit more about our collaboration, I would like to present to you and show, and uh, I want you to learn something about our academy. Yuli, can I ask you to switch on uh, the video for us? In 2010, the Russian Academy of National Economy and Public Administration, under the President of the Russian Federation, RENEPA, was established. It combined the Academy of National Economy and the Russian Academy of Public Administration, as well as 12 federal state educational institutions. What is the Presidential Academy nowadays? Currently, the Academy is a nationwide state administration school for the senior personnel pool an educational institution with higher educational programs and the country's most expanded network of branches. It is Russia's largest business school providing MBA and DBA programs, an effective system of expert research and development projects, 
for federal authorities and constituents of the Russian Federation, and a major scientific and innovative center. The Presidential Academy is an incomparable national leader in the training of top managers for Russian enterprises and organizations across the country. The total number of Academy students is more than 180,000, which includes students of RENEPA branches and more than 35,000 full-time students. As any classical university, the Presidential Academy provides professional training programs at all levels, bachelors, specialists, masters, and PhDs. We have branches in 52 constituents of the Russian Federation, in 65 cities, and integrity is most important to us. We maintain singular standards and foster a corporate culture. RENEPA is the largest educational institution in Europe in terms of the number of students and trainees, compared with most Russian and European universities. Uh, step by step, students get used to the assessment. So as also it has been mentioned today, this is a, a wonderful motivational factor. For someone it can be internal, for someone um, it can be external. By the end of the first year, we make sure that our students um, manage to gain as much knowledge that would give them the opportunity to move on and to master English. And um, during the second year, as you can see over here, uh, like on the top of the table, you can see business, business English. Um, our students um, prepare um, for sitting uh, back or now as we call it B2 business vantage and uh, C1 business um, higher. It takes the entire year and by the end of this um, they take their tests. You may ask me why, why do we need such a diversification? Uh, the answer is simple. Over here you can see all the partners that we're working with. As my colleague, the previous colleague mentioned that we have partnerships. Yeah, we also um, have a strong collaboration with these companies. And um, mm, as we're majoring at project management and uh, management in general, you can understand that these companies uh, provide our faculty and our students uh, with projects. So they're commissioned by these companies. And just to make sure that our students can successfully collaborate and work on the projects in English, uh, there is a requirement from our side that we developed at our faculty. This is B2 level. So with this level, they can work in, uh, in international uh, teams because we have international uh, partners all over the world. And obviously, you understand that English is not the aim, but this is a wonderful tool to talk about uh, serious things that is directly uh, related to their future careers. So uh, this is one of the reasons why we have Business English um, for our second year students. Um, after that, um, after receiving their results, we understand uh, that in the future they probably may decide of studying somewhere abroad or working for international companies also abroad and also on the territory of the Russian Federation. So that is why we decided um, to help with their uh, English certificate uh, portfolio diversification. <laughs> so that is why they can get um, C1 advanced. Uh, if they want to go to America or Canada, that can be TOEFL IBT or IELTS. Uh, mm, you may be surprised that we have GMATs. I understand that it's not the English test at all, but still it gives a key, like to, you can, oh, students can get uh, to uh, best um, master degree programs all over the world. I'm not talking about MBAs. So at least they, they will learn <laughs> how, to, uh, how to tackle this tricky examination that is purely for management, obviously.
Um, all this uh, brings us um, to certain objectives that we have developed. Um, and uh, this is our, I think that every teacher um, at FAS would agree that these are the things that we're trying to guarantee. Uh, let's take a look at our objectives. Uh, the first one, we must do everything. Uh, we have to do our best to make the English language an integral part of our students' lives. Because the, we, we, cannot, um, uh, we cannot have such a situation that they, and they treat English as something that is extra. Because this is, again, I, I repeat myself, but this is a key to, to, to the outside world and to, uh, to knowledge itself. Uh, the second objective is to make every effort to help our students speak English as fluently as their native language. I think that uh, this ob objective supports the first one. Uh, the third one is to ensure that our students have several international certificates confirming their level to make them more competitive on the market. So as I've already said, these are this is the um, connection with the pathways that we provide our students with uh, and obviously to give our students sufficient knowledge to meet requirements of any international uh, educational programs so we're trying to do as hard <laughs> and we work on that very hard uh, now coming to to the essence of my presentation I'm sorry if um, it took a little it took a little while like to explain how we managed to build our curriculum in terms of the English language preparation but nevertheless so the lingua skill itself um, uh, I think that we've been using lingua skill for approximately three years and I would like to show you some kind of facts uh, so um, let's talk about the previous academic year. So at the entrance, when our students were assessed, we found out that we have 20 students with C1 level, 90 students with B2 level, and uh, 15 uh, students with B1 level. That was the, the introductory, like the, the very beginning. Um, I'm very happy uh, to say that today I've heard a lot of references to the book, yeah, Empower. Uh, and uh, I thought that I would talk a bit about it, but I realized that uh, it's crystal clear why we have chosen that. Um, first of all, uh, it, like the major uh, advantage of this course book that it it has a complete alignment it, it like there is uh, uh, a wonderful correlation of everything what we have in each course book and we have the reflection on common European framework scale so this is fundamental so again our students can understand where they are and what is their aim by the end of the year so after using these books and uh, starting for one academic year, the results, as you can see, are here. So we have an obvious improvement, 45 people with C1, 70 people. So probably they were on the plateau where there was some kind of borderline between B1 and B2, but still they are solid up there. And uh, you, <laughs> you should remember that it's only the first year students and B1, uh, uh, 10 students confirmed uh, B1 level. Well, um, um, you know, I think that um, I need to talk about the future and um, how we see ourselves, um, how we're going to survive through certain things in this turbulent time. So that is why at the bottom of this slide over here, you can see our nearest future plan. On the 12th of June this year, we're going to take Linguist Skill Business and all in all, we're going to have 125 complete bundles for our students. Um, uh, 
I know that it's quite unexpected uh, for us teachers because we it wasn't planned from the very beginning. And uh, you will get the answer to this uncertainty in my words when you're going to listen to the feedback uh, by our students. So right now you're going to listen to two students, a representative of the first year and um, uh, a second year student who is going to take back, uh, not back, sorry, lingua skill business. Uh, Yuli, can I ask you to, yes, thank you. Is there a problem? Anna, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I, I don't know. There was a, a glitch, I guess. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. This is sometimes technical issues. That's uh, everything that's got normal, frozen. Actually. I was like, ah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. So I mean, all right. Okay, so I mute myself then, right? Uh, just a second. I will uh, try to. Um, I will remove these files and upload it um, uh, again. Okay, just just a second. My name is Max, and I'm the first year student of the Faculty of Social and Economic Sciences. My studies here began with the Lingua Skill General Task. We were suggested to take this task in order to check our knowledge, out of the blue, without warning. Although I never did something similar before, I found the tasks understandable and the interface convenient. The task itself did not cause any difficulties, although some tasks were a little bit tricky. I did not prepare for the task specifically, I was guided more by intuition and previously acquired experience. As a result, I got a high score and got into the strongest group. For me personally, it was a good opportunity to find out with what knowledge I came to the university. So. As you can understand, he was guided, like it was a motivational thing for him. And uh, uh, I know that still they, they, they're, they, they're going to take another go with, with the test, but still. Okay, if you didn't mind, let's take a look at um, the second video uh, recorded by one of our second year students. Hi, my name is Dasha and I'm a second year student of FES Ranipa. Our educational program includes back exam, which we are supposed to take because next year, if we get good results, we get a permission to participate in international projects. I personally was preparing for back hire. Unfortunately, due to coronavirus, we won't be able to take it in May as it was initially implied. To be honest, we had a fear that if the exam was postponed till October or November, we would squander our skills and wouldn't be able to pass the exam successfully. However, afterwards, the decision to check the results of our year-long study of um, business skills using LinguaSkill Business was made. The first reaction that we had, well, we were absolutely shocked because it is a new and unknown exam so we felt a bit disappointed and didn't want our preparation to go down the drain. But we thought so until we started looking through sample papers. It was the moment when we realized that linguistic School Business and Back Exam are really similar to each other and the only difference is uh, its online format, which we just have to get used to. So uh, we are looking forward to taking this exam on the 20th of June uh, so wish us good luck.
fingers crossed. Truly, let's wish them good luck because it would be an absolutely new experience for them and for us because the entire year we have been preparing and teaching our students to uh, seat uh, back exam vantage or higher. Um, anyway, uh, as you can see, like if you remember from the uh, introductory video about the academy, we have a lot of branches and hopefully um, we're going to share our expertise, our knowledge, our experience uh, with other branches of the academy. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that I managed to express and deliver all the insights regarding um, the way we work with lingua skill general and now soon it would be business. Um, Julia? <laughs> Thanks a lot to, to listen uh, to your experience, to find out more about how Russian university universities work, uh, how they use lingua skill or, already. So um, I would like to thank all the uh, presenters today, all the participants, all the attendees for being with us during this conference. It took us about three hours, so it was quite long, but I hope the information was useful. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, before we close this webinar room, I would like to remind you that we will uh, share all the materials soon. The uh, video of our webinar, the slides, <clears throat> and the certificates of uh, attendance. So they will be sent to your email within a few days. Uh, please uh, stay patient and wait for email from us. Thanks a lot. And uh, now I would like to show you a short video about uh, uh, proctoring, remote proctoring, how it works, how, um, how uh, people now can take exams, uh, tests from home. So I hope... Um, it will be interesting for you. And uh, before I turn on the video, I would like to say goodbye. Wish you all the best and um, stay safe, stay home. If you're still, um, um, uh, unfortunately, we still have this uh, unstable situation and uh, many cities, many places are still under lockdown. So uh, this is the most important thing. Stay safe. Thank you for participating. These young people live in different cities and study different subjects at different universities. In just a few minutes, they are all going to take their exams. Some of them will do it from the comfort of their armchair, and others will go to a special exam center. To ensure that they are all tested in the same way and that the grades are fair, the examination process must be carefully regulated. Enter Examus, an online invigilator service, or, in other words, a tool to help supervise students during an examination. Examus uses automated algorithms to identify students and analyze their behavior to detect violations of exam regulations. This information is then passed on to a human invigilator who monitors and adjusts the system. The user identification process is based on face recognition technology. The system compares an image from the student's webcam with one or more of their sample images. The invigilator then compares the images manually. This comprehensive method gives a 98% accurate user identification. What's more, there are plans to include additional identifying algorithms, such as electronic signatures, ECGs and other biometric measurements. Examus automatically records any violations and informs the invigilator. If the student looks away from the screen for longer than is warranted, 
if the active window on the computer suddenly changes, if the student leaves their desk, or if someone else is there with them. If someone else's voice is heard through the student's microphone, or if somebody else tries to sit the exam for them. The behavioral analysis algorithms mean the system can be easily adapted to work with different people. The user's standard behavior is assessed by the system over time and taken into account. The more records of a student's behavior that are recorded in the examiner's database, the more accurately their behavior can be predicted and understood. Did the student look because they were distracted or to secretly glance at a crib sheet? The involvement of invigilators ensures violations can be detected accurately, even if little information on the student has been stored, and the fact of being observed also heightens the disciplinary effect. The invigilators deal with rule breakers appropriately. This gives Examus more flexibility in his reaction to student behavior, in line with the standards of each university. It also allows invigilators to clarify information in the event of disputes. Examus can be easily configured to suit different exam conditions, strict tests where the use of any additional materials is forbidden, and more open examinations where, for example, calculations can be made on paper outside the testing system. All data collected by Examus is transferred to educational institutions for in-depth analysis. Teachers can monitor the exam results of individual students. And all the data collected undergoes comprehensive processing to see if the testing methods need to be adjusted or examination tasks improved. The Examus Invigilator service allows you to set up a flexible ecosystem of online examinations securely connecting student laptops to the university's LMS, Learning Management System.